In my last video, I discussed the experiments of William Gilbert, which he published in his work De Magneta in the year 1600. If you haven't seen that video, I'd recommend watching it first, as this video is a continuation. The publication of De Magneta was a milestone in electrical science, but it was not as popular in its time as we might think. Another 29 years would pass before further experiments were taken up by the Jesuit priest Niccolo Cabello. This was again only a digression in Cabello's treatise on terrestrial magnetism, that is, magnetism of the earth, and it didn't provide many new insights. Looking back, however, we can recognize in Cabello's work the first indications of electric repulsion. Cabello records that fine wood or iron particles are sometimes attracted so strongly to an electric as to rebound. He says, If the face of the electric is well prepared, and shavings of iron or wood or other similar bodies are presented so as to be attracted to it, they are so eagerly rushed to the electric that when they meet with it, they leap back and do not fall directly downwards, but are repelled far to a distance of three or four digits. To Cabello's interpretation, what he's seeing is not electrical repulsion, something he specifically rejects, but instead is evidence that Gilbert's theory of water effluvia, emanating from an electrified material, must be wrong. Cabello puts forward the idea that air near the electric is rarefied, creating small air currents which draw the chaff and paper to the electric. But when the attracted objects have too much velocity, they bounce off the electric instead of sticking to it on account of the impact. Let's repeat Cabello's experiment. First, we'll do it as he describes it. It's harder to see, but you might argue it's more authentic. I filed a piece of brass down until I had a good pile of brass shavings, then electrified a plastic stick by rubbing it with a wool rag. If you watch very closely, you'll see that while many brass particles adhere to the electric, a fair number rapidly repel away from it. It happens so quick that it's difficult to tell what's happening. To more clearly demonstrate the effect, we can use a light ball with a conductive shell. I've made a few of these using pith from an elderberry bush and some gold leaf normally used for baking. It's much easier to make the pith ball using conductive paint rather than gold leaf, especially if you don't have the normal materials for gilding. For those interested, gilding is typically done with gold leaf and an adhesive called size. In place of a proper size, I used some rosin-based liquid flux that I have from soldering, and it didn't work that well, so I wouldn't recommend it. After sticking a silk thread into the pith ball, I strung it up from a simple stand I made which has a brass ring on the bottom. I added the ring just by crimping on some hobby style brass tubing. Its purpose is to discharge the pith ball whenever it makes contact. Bringing the electrified plastic stick toward the pith ball, we immediately see the effect Cabello described magnified in scale. The pith ball jumps to make contact with the electric, then repels far away. I quickly discovered a number of interesting experiments that used pith balls, such as this bouncing effect, created by rapidly charging and then discharging the pith ball between the brass ring and an electric. In another experiment, two pith balls were suspended from silk threads and one was electrified. The pith balls immediately repel one another and avoid the electric as well. I discovered these by accident, and the materials came together so easily, it's surprising that nobody would perform such experiments until the middle of the 18th century. I translated a fair amount of Cabello's work from Latin into English and posted it on my website, so if you want to see how Cabello describes it in his own words, uh, please check it out there. Cabello's work was influenced by Gilbert and was influential to other 17th century scientists, such as Athanasius Kircher, Ken Elm Digby, Thomas Brown, and Honoré Fabry. The latter, Fabry, a French Jesuit who was highly regarded by his peers, serves as our connection between Cabello and our next subject, the Accademia del Cimento in Florence. I'm excited to talk about the Accademia because it is less widely known than many of its contemporary societies, like the Royal Society of London and the Académie Royale des Sciences in Paris, both of which it predated, making it perhaps the first learned society in early modern Europe. Unlike the Royal Society and the Académie Royale, both of which lasted centuries after their founding, the Academia del Cimento, or Academy of Experiment, operated for only 10 years, from 1657 to 1667. Its operation and organization were loose in that some of its members, such as Fabri, were really more like correspondents, and others never even entered into the same region as the Academia in the first place. 
Its work was highly influential, serving as a sort of lab manual for practical experimentation for the next century. And what's more, the manuscripts of the Academia still survive, as do a number of experimental apparatus, if you count reproductions, giving a much more tangible aspect to their work. The surviving apparatus are maintained by the Museo Galileo, and the manuscripts have been kept and digitized by the Biblioteca Nazionale Centrale in Florence. In preparation for this video, I transcribed a large amount of the diary and some of the original notes used by the Academia, which you can find on my website. This includes excerpts from one of the five diaries which survive, the most complete of the Academia's diary, which was begun, the diary that is, in June of 1657 and continued until its end in 1667. The excerpts I chose mostly relate to the Academia's electrical experiments, but there's some other stuff in there too. There is so much that could be said about the Academia, but I'm going to focus on just one aspect, their experiments with electrifying amber in vacuo, a significant test of Cabello's air currents theory. Vacuum science was indeed still in its earliest days in the 1660s, and the primary means of achieving vacuum was to use the Torricelli space, named for Evangelista Torricelli, which is the vacuum created in a tube of mercury when the mercury has been allowed to drain from one end only while the other remains sealed. Mercury would actually continue to be used for pulling vacuums, albeit in different forms and by different mechanisms, through the turn of the 20th century. It's impractical to reconstruct the Academia's apparatus for performing their experiments, not least of all because it requires a large amount of mercury, so we'll have to make do with the drawings and description. The reference for these experiments is the main publication of the Academia, the Saggy, or Essays, translated into English by Richard Waller in 1684. I also found what appears to be an early sketch of the vacuum apparatus in the manuscripts, shown here, but the text simply defers to the essays. Begin with a glass bulb with a long tube and a dish. The bulb should have three mouths, one on top for pouring the mercury in, one on the side for inserting a hand, and one on the bottom for releasing the mercury into the dish. A piece of paper is suspended by a thread inside the bulb to show any electric attraction with amber, and a cloth is adhered to the wall of the bulb using gum, that's the plant product, uh, which the amber will be rubbed with. The bottom of the tube is sealed with a lamb's bladder, and is resting upon some cotton or a cushion to handle the weight of the mercury. Another bladder is tied to a lip on the side opening, which is kept open at the other side to allow a man's hand to be sealed inside the vacuum. The idea is that a hand holding amber is bound to the bladder at the wrist with a leather strap for a seal. Then mercury is poured in to fill the entire vessel to the top of the bulb. The top is then sealed with another bladder, and the bottom of the tube is allowed to drain by removing its seal, so that the mercury pulls a vacuum in the top of the chamber as it falls. The hand then rubs the amber upon the cloth, and attempts to show electric attraction with the paper. This didn't work. The vacuum was immediately broken due to leaks at the wrist, so the experimenters tried using a wooden rod with amber stuck to its end to obtain a tighter seal. Even still, air forced itself into the bulb immediately and the wooden rod couldn't move freely enough if the vacuum had remained. So they made a new vessel with the wooden stick coming in through the top. Then chaff is tossed in and the vessel is filled with mercury. When the mercury is drained, the chaff sticks to the walls of the vessel, the amber is rubbed, and then it is presented to the straw. Still no success. And in fact, they tried repeating the experiment without any vacuum and found that the amber wouldn't attract the chaff anyway. They tried replacing the cloth, changing the adhesive, and even dipped a cloth in mercury to see if that impeded the electric response in any way, but the cloth that was dipped in mercury still worked to electrify amber. Their apparatus simply wasn't sophisticated enough to work properly, so they gave up their efforts. That's how it goes in experimental science. But we're fortunate that the academia recorded their failings alongside their successes so that we can appreciate the lengths they went to in order to make an experiment work and can look inside their experimental thought process a little more. They might not have been aware, but a new instrument, the vacuum pump, had been developed years earlier by another notable electrical experimenter, Otto von Goerich, and it was improved and put to great use by Robert Boyle in the years following. But much has already been written about Goerich and Boyle and their electrical experiments. Here, I'm satisfied to have explored the lesser known works that contributed to the early developments 
of this fascinating science. We are yet in the earliest days of electrical experiment, but the 18th century is rapidly approaching, and soon enough the narrow topic of rubbing and electrification would give way to electric lights, sounds, toys, and stage shows, dazzling the public and exciting the interest of scientists all over Europe. 